Welcome back to episode 8 of the Theo Jaffe podcast. Today, I had the pleasure of speaking with Scott Aronson. Scott is the Schlumberger Chair of Computer Science and Director of the Quantum Information Center at the University of Texas at Austin. Previously, he got his Bachelor's in Computer Science from Cornell, his PhD in Complexity Theory from UC Berkeley, held postdocs at Princeton and Waterloo, and taught at MIT. Currently, he's on leave to work on OpenAI's super alignment team along with chief scientist Ilya Sutskever. His blog, Shtetl Optimized, one of my favorites, discusses quantum computing, AI, mathematics, physics, education, and a host of other interesting subjects that we discuss in this episode. I've been a huge fan of Scott for a while, and I've really been looking forward to this episode. I hope you'll enjoy listening to it as much as I enjoyed recording it. This is the Theo Jaffe Podcast. Thank you for listening. And now, here's Scott Aronson. Hi, welcome back to episode eight of the Theo Jaffe Podcast, here today with Scott Aronson. Hi, it's great to be here. All right, so first off, can you tell us a little bit about your background, specifically like how you got into quantum and AI in the first place? Yeah, so so I guess I got into computer science as a kid, mostly because I wanted to uh, create my own video games. Uh, you know, I, uh, 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 you know, played a lot of Nintendo and it just seemed like, you know, these are these are whole universes that uh, unlike our universe, you know, someone must really understand because someone made them. And, uh, you know, I had no idea what would be entailed in, in, uh, in, 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 in actually bringing one to life, you know, whether, you know, there was some uh, 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 crazy uh, factory equipment that you needed. And uh, when I was, you know, 11 or so, uh, uh, someone showed me, uh, at, at that time, it was, it was, it was Apple basic. Okay, so uh, uh, and, they, and they showed me, you know, some, some, some game, and then here's the code. Right. And, uh, you know, the code is not just some description of the game. Uh, it is the game. Right. Yeah. You change it and, uh, uh, you know, it'll do something different. And, you know, I like to say that for me, that was a revelation comparable to, you know, learning where babies come from. Right. It was like, why didn't why didn't I know about this before? Uh, and and so I wanted to uh, learn everything I could about about programming. Um, uh, you know, and, 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 but, but, but I, I still had the idea that, uh, uh, um, 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 you know, as, as, as you wanted to write a, uh, a more and more sophisticated program, you would need a more and more sophisticated programming language. Right. And, you know, and so, so then, you know, the, the, the idea of Turing universality that like, you know, once you have just a certain set of rules, then you were already at the ceiling. Right. And anything that you could express in any programming language, you know, in principle, you could express in Apple basic, you know, you wouldn't want to, but, uh, uh, but you could, right. That was, that was a further revelation to me. And, you know, and then that made me feel like, uh, uh, wow, I, I guess, I guess I don't have to learn that much about physics then. Right. Because, uh, yeah, uh, you know, I've, you know, I'd always been curious about about physics, but then, you know, once you know about computational universality, then uh, it seems like, OK, whatever are the specific laws of, you know, particles and forces in, in this universe. Right. Those are just like, you know, the choice between uh, C and Pascal or whatever. Right. They're just implementation details. Um, but then, uh, 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 you know, I. Uh, uh, um, uh, well, well, I, I, I um, you know, th this, this was, this was the mid 1990s. Uh, you know, this was uh, during, uh, let's say, the first uh, uh, internet boom, and, and of course, you know, I, I thought about, you know, is, you know, is that my future? Uh, do I uh, try to uh, become a software engineer, start a software company? Uh, but you know, I, I, I realized that uh, uh, even though you know, I, 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 I love programming. Uh, I, I stunk at software engineering. Uh, uh, you know, as soon as I had to make my code work with other people's code, or document it, or get it done by a deadline, you know, then, 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 you know, there, there, there were always going to be other people who would just have enormous advantages over me, and uh, and so I was more drawn to the 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 theoretical side. 
And you know, once you start learning about uh, the theory of computer science, then you start learning about uh, how much time do various things take, right? Uh, complexity theory. Uh, you learn about the the uh, the famous p versus n p problem, and and so forth. And and then um, you know, when 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 uh, when I was a teenager, I uh, uh, um, uh, you know came came a further revelation, which was you know I read a popular article about uh, Shor's quantum factoring algorithm. Which had just recently been discovered, uh, and and uh, you know the, the way that the popular articles sort of described it then as now was that you know sure discovered that just uh, if you use quantum mechanics then uh, you can um, um, you can just try every possible divisor in a different parallel universe, <laughs> and and you know and thereby solve the problem exponentially faster. And, and my first reaction uh, on reading that was, well, this sounds like obvious garbage. You know, this sounds like physicists who just, you know, do not understand what they are up against. They don't understand computational universality, right? And, uh, 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 you know, this, 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 you know, whatever they're saying, you know, maybe it works for, you know, a, a few particles, but it, you know, but it's not going to, it's never going to scale. It's never going to factor a really big number. But, uh, but uh, you know, of course, uh, you know, I had to learn. Uh, uh, so, uh, so then what is this quantum mechanics? Right? Uh, uh, what does it actually say? And so I, I started reading about it, you know, uh, um, um, you know, this is probably when I'm 16, 17, you know, something like that. Uh, and, you know, there were, there were web pages, uh, you know, uh, uh, explaining it and, you uh, and and what was what was remarkable to me was that quantum mechanics was actually much much simpler than uh, than I had I had feared that it would be uh, once you take the physics out of it. <laughs> so you know the the way you know what I what I uh, f you know learned was okay you know in, in high school they tell you okay the uh, you know the electron is not in one place it's in a sort of smear of 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 you know probability around around the uh, nucleus uh, until you look at it and and you and and you know your first reaction is well that doesn't make any sense that sounds like just a fancy way of saying that uh, they don't know where the electron is right uh, but uh, uh, you know the, the 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 thing that you learn is you know is start as soon as you start you know uh, uh, um, reading about let's say quantum computing or quantum information is that uh, well, no, it, it, it's it's a different set of rules of probability, and and this is really the crucial thing about quantum mechanics, right? That you know, in ordinary life, we talk about you know the pro the probability of something happening. It's a uh, real number from zero to one, uh, but you know, we would never talk about a negative thirty percent chance of something happening, much less a, a complex number chance. Uh, but in quantum mechanics, we have to replace quantum mechanics. Uh, by these complex numbers, uh, which are called amplitudes, okay? And in some sense, everything that is different about quantum mechanics uh, uh, is all a consequence of this one change that we make to, to, uh, to, to how we calculate probabilities, okay? Which says, you know, first we have to calculate these amplitudes, these complex numbers, and then on measurement, the, these amplitudes become probabilities. Okay, so and the rule is that the when, when we when we make a measurement, the probability that we see some outcome is equal to the square of the absolute value of its amplitude. Uh, but you know the result of that is that if something can happen one way with a positive amplitude and another way with a negative amplitude, then 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 the two uh, contributions can cancel each other out, and the thing happens with a you know uh, the total amplitude is zero and the thing never happens at all. And so then, you know, th th this just sort of reduced everything to, you know, linear algebra, to just, you know, dealing with matrices and vectors of complex numbers, uh, you know, and you didn't have to deal with any uh, infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces or anything like that, you know, it was all just, you know, these little finite dimensional matrices. And I said, okay, I could actually understand that. And uh, at the time, um, um, you know, um, quantum computing was, was, was very new. There was still a lot of low hanging fruit. You know, Shor had discovered his factoring algorithm. Uh, uh, you know, not by just trying all of the 
you know, divisors in parallel, you know, it's something much more subtle that, you know, you have to take advantage of the way that these amplitudes uh, being complex numbers, you know, work differently from probabilities and can, you know, interfere with each other. So, uh, you know, and, and, and you also had to use very, very special properties of, of this, uh, the problem of factoring that, uh, 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 that, that don't seem to be shared by many other problems. Okay, so I so I, I I learned all of that, but then you know there was, uh, there was still uh, you know so many questions. Uh, you know what else could a quantum computer be good for, right? And in general, you know what is the boundary between you know what is efficiently computable and what is not, right? And like you might have thought that that would be you know uh, uh, answerable a priori, right? Just like you know the the question of what is computable at all you know, uh, seem to have been maybe, you know, answerable a priori just by, you know, Church and Turing and people like that thinking about it really hard. Okay, but as soon as you ask what is computable efficiently, you know, we now had this powerful example that says the laws of physics actually matter. They are relevant. Uh, uh, you know, at the very least, uh, uh, you know, the, the fact that, that the universe is quantum mechanical uh, uh, seems to change the answer. And so, you know, that just, it just brought together the sort of the biggest questions of physics and computer science in a way that um, um, seemed irresistible to me. And so, uh, um, you know, I, I was an undergrad at, at Cornell, you know, doing um, summer internships at Bell Labs when I really first got into this stuff. Uh, but then, you know, I, I uh, my, my dream was to go to graduate school at Berkeley, uh, which was sort of the center of uh, 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 theoretical quantum computing uh, at, at the time. And um, I was lucky enough to, to get accepted there, but actually the people who accepted me and recruited me there were not the quantum computing people, they were the AI people. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I had also been, you know, of course, very curious about AI uh, as an undergrad. I think one of the first programs that I wrote after I learned programming was I said, you know, okay, I'm going to just build an AI that will follow Asimov's three laws of robotics. What yeah. were your AGI timelines back then? <laughs> you know, I I, I I I don't I don't usually think in terms of timelines. That's the thing, right? I think in terms of what is the next thing. We, you know, what is the easiest thing that we don't already know how to do, and how do we do that thing? Did you right? predict neural networks? Um, I, I I knew about neural networks. You know, in the '90s, I was you know curious about them. I read about them. But, you know, the the standard, you know, wisdom, the thing everyone knew in the 90s was that neural nets don't work that well, right? They're just not very impressive. And, uh, uh, you know, I think, you know, there, there were people who speculated about, uh, well, you know, maybe if you ran them on, a, you know, a million times greater scale, then they would, you know, then they would start to work. But, you know, no one could try it, right? And so, so I... Um, I mean, I certainly, as a thought experiment, you know, I, I thought about, you know, uh, 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 okay, you know, like, like in order to, sh to, to show that, that uh, 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 AI sh is possible in principle, you know, if nothing else, we could simulate an entire brain neuron by neuron, right? You know, I certainly, I certainly thought about that. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the idea that you were just going to scale neural nets and then, you know, in, in a mere 20 or 25 years, you know, they would start, you know, being able to understand language, showing human-like intelligence. No, I did not predict that. I think that I was, I was uh, uh, as shocked by that as, as, as nearly anyone. Uh, mm -hmm. and, you know, but, but you know, the, the, uh, the, 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 I, I feel like the least I can do, you know, having, having not predicted this, you know, actually, you know, not even knowing how I should have predicted this, you know, based on any theoretical principle, uh, but at least I can update now that it's happened. At least, you know, I can not be in denial about it or not try to invent excuses for why it doesn't really count. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, but, but, you know, I, anyway, you know, my, my, my first year in grad school at Berkeley, I actually was doing AI, uh, was uh, with, with uh, Mike Jordan. I was uh, studying, you know, graphical models and, you um, um, you know, statistical machine learning, uh, which, which of course, you know, you know, ended up being massively important. And, you know, and I could, you know, even in 2000, 
uh, at the time, I could see that that it would be very important. Uh, but um, um, you know, the 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 the, the, what, the the problem I kept running into, and and this this hasn't really changed, right? Is that everything in AI, you know, that you really care about seems to bottom out in just some empirical evaluation that you have to do, right? So it's like you never really really understand why anything is working. Right, you uh, you know, to the extent that you fully understand it, then we no longer even call it AI. <laughs> so uh, uh, it's like you know, you you have a, a, a sort of a you know, in any research project, the uh, the root node might look like theory, you know, might look like uh, the kind of thing that I'm good at. But then once you get down to the leaf nodes, then it's almost always uh, where you just you have to implement it. And you know, do the numerics and just make a bar chart. And uh, so I kind of, you know, I got drawn more to quantum computing, partly just because you know there were so many meaty questions there that I could address uh, uh, using theory, and and I felt like that was where my comparative advantage was. So back to quantum for a moment. Yeah. Absolutely. Obviously, there are lots and lots of issues with like current day quantum computers. There's um, not sufficient error correction or shielding or anything like that but in like i mean we're just we're just starting to have any error correction at all yeah in a future where we do have much better mm -hmm. error correction and like mm -hmm. everything that we would need for quantum to actually work practically what mm -hmm. kinds of applications could you see for classical computers you mean for quantum computers or or so, sorry so you mean you mean uh um well, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, for, for for quantum computing, you know, there are there are two applications that really tower over all of the others, and you know, and 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 you know, after thirty years of quantum algorithms research, you know, uh, many people wish that there would be you know uh, uh, much more than these two, but I think that these are still uh, uh, the two biggest ones, and the first one is the simulating uh, um, um, nature itself at the quantum level. Right, so uh, uh, simulating chemical reactions, you know, simulating uh, materials that involve, you know, lots of uh, correlated electrons. Uh, so that could be useful if you're designing better batteries, uh, better solar cells, uh, high temperature superconductors. Um, you know, if you uh, want, you know, better ways of making fertilizer. Uh, uh, you know, a a, a a, a quantum computer could potentially be useful for, for, for any of that, right? So this is not stuff that, that most computer users care about, right? Or that, they, that, they're, that they're, you know, directly doing. Uh, but, uh, you know, this is stuff that, that is tremendously important for certain industries, right? And, uh, you know, th this was the quantum simulation was the original application of quantum computing that Richard Feynman had in mind you know, when he proposed the idea of a quantum computer uh, more than 40 years ago. And I think it's still the economically most valuable application that we know about, right? No, and, you know, that's, that, that, that's just the truth of it, right? And, 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 and the second, you know, big application, of course, is the famous one that put quantum computing onto everyone's radar when it was discovered in the 90s. And this is uh, Shor's algorithm and uh, related uh, uh, algorithms that are able to break uh, uh, essentially all of the public key encryption that we currently use to protect the internet, right? So anything that's based on RSA or Diffie-Hellman or elliptic curve cryptography, really, you know, any public key crypto system that's based on some hidden structure in an abelian group, okay? and. Um, but now, you know, the, the second one, well, it's hard to uh, uh, present it as a positive application for humanity, right? It's, it's, it's useful for whatever intelligence agency or, or criminal syndicate gets it first, you know, especially if no one else knows that they have it. Okay, but, you know, the obvious response to quantum computers breaking our uh, existing encryption is just going to be to switch to different forms of encryption. Uh, which, which seem to resist attack even by quantum computers. And we have pretty decent candidates for you know, quantum resistant encryption now, uh, especially uh, public key crypto systems that are based on high dimensional lattices. And uh, so, so you know, a, a NIST, 
the uh, uh, you know National Institute of Standards and Technology has already started the process of trying to migrate people to these uh, uh, um, you know hopefully quantum resistant crypto systems. You know that 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 could easily take a decade. Okay, but you know assuming that that's done successfully, then you could say, well, then we're all just right back where we started. Right. So, so, so now the, the, you know, the big question in quantum algorithms has been, well, you know, what is a quantum computer useful for besides these two things, you know, quantum simulation, which is what it's sort of obvious, you know, designed to do what it sort of does in its sleep, you know, and then breaking public key encryption where like, because of this amazing mathematical coincidence you know it just it so happens that we 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 base our cryptography on these mathematical problems that are are susceptible to quantum attack right and so so um so so the 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 you know what 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 would really make quantum computing you know revolutionary for everyday life would be if it could uh give dramatic speed ups for let's say machine learning or for optimization problems, uh, or for uh, uh, you know constraint satisfaction, right? Finding proofs of theorems. So you know the you know the the holy grail of computer science are you know the NP complete problems, right? These are the problems uh, that are sort of the you know the the the, the hardest problems among those uh, where a solution can be efficiently checked once it's found. Right. Uh, you know, so examples would be, you know, the traveling salesman problem, you know, finding the shortest route that visits a bunch of cities, uh, solving a Sudoku puzzle, uh, um, you know, things like like finding the optimal parameters for a, a, a neural network are, 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 are maybe not not quite NP complete, but 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 it, uh, in any case, very, very close to that. Uh, by contrast, factoring uh, is is, is uh, as far as we know, uh, hard for a classical computer, but is not believed to be NP complete. By the way, what's your intuition on P equals NP? You think- Oh, uh, oh I, I mean, I, I, I like to say that if we were physicists, then we would have just declared it a law of nature that P is not equal to NP. And we would have just given ourselves Nobel prizes for the discovery of that law. Uh, you know, seems like you know if, it, if it if it later turned out that p equals np, then we could give ourselves more Nobel prizes for the law's overthrow, right? But like uh, with George Hawkins, uh, you know, you, you 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 could say like there there are so many questions that I have so much more uncertainty about, right? It's like in 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 math, you know, if something is not proven, then you have to call it a conjecture, right? You you know you. Uh, but uh, uh, but it's like there there are there are there are there are, there are many things that that you know, let's say the you know the the physicists are are confident about you know that you know quantum mechanics is true for example right that 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 you know that I am actually much less confident about than I am in in p not equal to n p. Yeah, I, it's like what George Haas says: hard things are hard. Like I believe hard things. Yeah. are well, yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, okay, so, 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 so I, I think that, you know, if, if you're going to make an empirical case for, you know, why to believe P is not equal to NP, you know, what, what the case hinges on is that, like, we know thousands and thousands of examples of problems that are in P, right, that have polynomial time algorithms, efficient algorithms that have been discovered for them, uh, and we have thousands of other problems that have been proven to be NP complete. Right, so like as hard as any problem, you know, in 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 NP, which is the uh, efficiently checkable problems. Okay, and if only one of those problems had turned out to be in both of those classes, then you know you, that that would have uh, immediately implied P equals NP, right? And yet, you know, there seems to be, you know, I, I've called it an invisible electric fence. Right, there seems to be this, you know, uh, sort of invisible fence. Sometimes even the same problem, you know, as you vary a parameter, like you know, it, it switches from being in P to being NP complete, right? But you never ever find that at the same parameter value, it's both in P and it's NP complete, right? So, so it seems like you know, you know, at least you know, relative to the current knowledge of our civilization, like there is something that separates these two gigantic clusters, right? And the most parsimonious explanation would be that they are really different, right? That, you know, P is not equal to NP. But, you know, the, 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 the other thing to say here is that there are, um, there, there are much, much weaker things, you know, than, than, than P equals NP that would already be a shock 
if they were true. For example, if there were a fast classical algorithm for factoring, right? That wouldn't, you know, that wouldn't even need p equals np, right? But that would already, I mean, that would, that would, that would completely break the internet, right? Yeah. That would be, a, you know, a, a civilizational shock, right? If there were, you know, a, you know, and, 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 and so, so now a big question that people have thought about for 30 years now is, could there be a fast quantum algorithm for solving the NP complete problems, right? And, and, you know, of course, of course, we can't prove that there isn't, you know, we can't even prove there's not a fast classical algorithm. That's the P versus NP question. But, but by now we formed a lot of intuition that, you know, for, for NP complete problems, quantum computers uh, do seem to give you a modest advantage. Okay, and this comes from uh, uh, the second most famous quantum algorithm after Shor's algorithm, which is called Grover's algorithm, right? And Grover's algorithm, uh, which was discovered in 1996, uh, lets you take any problem involving like n possible solutions where, you know, you, you for each solution, you know how to check whether it's valid or not. And it lets you find a valid solution, uh, if there is one, using a number of steps that scales only with the square root of n, right? So, so compared to Shor's algorithm, that has an enormously wider range of applications. That's like, you know, probably like three quarters of what's in an algorithms textbook, you know, has some component that can be Groverized, right? That can be sped up, you know, by Grover's algorithm. Okay, but the disadvantage is that the speed up is not exponential, right? The speed up is merely quadratic. It's merely n to square root of n. Or, you know, for some problems, you don't even get the full square root. It goes from n to n to the two thirds power or, or something like that. Okay, but Grover speed ups are never more than square root, right? So, so and, 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 and after 30 years of research, you know, as far as we know, for most kind of, you know, a uh, uh, hard combinatorial problems, you know, including NP complete ones, uh, a, a quantum computer, you know, can give you a Grover speed up, but probably not more than that, right? Or, or, or you know, if, if, if it can give more, then that requires some, some quantum algorithm that is just wildly different from anything that we know. Okay, just, you know, just like a fast classical algorithm would have to be very different from anything we know. So, uh, you know, so, so yeah, I mean, you know, if, if there, if, if someone were to discover a, you know, a polynomial time quantum algorithm for, for uh, 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 NP complete problems, then you could say, you know, you know, the case for building practical quantum computers would just, you know, would, would, would get multiplied by like, by, by orders of magnitude, right? But uh, uh uh, you know, even even to get any speed up more than the Grover speed up, like if you could solve NP complete problems on a quantum computer in two to the square root of n time, you know, instead of two to the n, that would be a big deal. So, okay, but uh, yeah, speaking speaking of computational complexity theory, uh -huh. I read a tweet recently. It was for whatever reason very niche. I would have uh, loved for it to be on the front page of Twitter, but it said mm -hmm. the cardinal sin of philosophy and mathematics, ignoring computational complexity. I wish we could redo the last four hundred years, but replace Occam's razor simplicity prior with Dijkstra's razor speed prior. So, what do you think about that? Uh, well, I mean, I, I wrote a fifty-page article twelve years ago, which was called uh, "Why Philosophers Should Care About Computational Complexity." So, you know, I guess uh, 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 you could put me down in the column of, of yes, <laughs> I do think that computational complexity is, is, is relevant to, you know, a huge number of, of philosophical questions. Uh, it's not relevant to all of them necessarily. So for example, you know, if, if all you want to know is like, is X determined by Y, right? Or uh, 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 so, you know, for example, if you're discussing free will versus determinism, Right then, uh, it's hard for me to see how how the length of the inferential chain, you know, is, is really uh, really really changes that. Right, it, it seems like you know uh, 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 I am I am just as bound by a by a long inferential chain as I am by a short one. Right, but uh, you know there are many many other questions like. Um, uh, uh, like, you know, do, where, where, you know, I want to know, you know, is something doing explanatory work or not, right? So, you know, I mean, uh, uh, sometimes, you know, the, uh, 
uh, um, um, people will say, well, well, uh, uh, um, um, you know, Darwinian natural selection, right, is not really doing explanatory work, right, because uh, it's just, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, it, 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 it just saying, you know, yeah, you know, a bunch of random things happened, and then there was life. Right, but no, you know, the, the, you know, a way that you can articulate why it is doing explanatory work is that if you really just had, you know, the tornado in the junkyard, right? If you just had a a, a bunch of a, a random uh, um, 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 events that then, you know, happen to result in a living organism, then you would expect it to take exponential time, right? And and you know the the you know the Earth is is old. It's four billion years old, but it is not nearly old enough for for exponential you know brute force search to have worked, right? Uh, to like search through all possible you know DNA sequences, for example, uh, for for example, right? That would just take far far longer than uh, than the than the age of the known universe, and and so. You know, of course, uh, uh, natural selection, you know, is a, a type of gradient descent algorithm, right? It is a, you know, non-random survival of, you know, randomly varying uh, replicators. And, and, you know, that is what gives it its power, right? Uh, so, you know, another uh, uh, example, right? Uh, uh, you know, e even just, just to articulate, like, what it means to know something. Like, uh, uh, you know, a puzzle that I really like is uh, what is the largest known prime number? Okay. Now, uh, you know, if you go look this up on Google, uh, it'll give you something. Uh, uh, it'll be a, a Mersenne prime. Um, uh, here, I can look it up right now. Uh, uh, it says uh, 2 to the 82,589,933 minus 1. Uh, that that is uh, as of this October it says that is currently the largest known prime number, you know, and it's it's a it's a uh, called a Mersenne prime, right? Two to some power minus one. Okay, but now I could ask, uh, well, 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 no, I uh, 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 why can't I say I actually know a bigger prime number than that, namely the next one after that? <laughs> oh, the the big numbers thing. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you, could say, you know, you could say, look, you know, I have just specified a bigger prime number that I know, right? It's the it's the next one after that, you know, two to the uh, eighty two million and so forth. Uh, and you know, you could say, okay, it's definitely prime. You know, I can even give you an algorithm to find that number, right? But uh, uh, if, if you want to articulate why I'm cheating, then I think you have to say something like, well, I haven't given you a provably polynomial time algorithm, <laughs> right? So, you know, I've, I've given you an algorithm that ac actually, based on uh, conjectures and number theory, it probably does terminate, you know, reasonably quickly with, uh, with, with, with the next prime number after that, uh, but no one has proven it, <laughs> okay? So, uh, um, so, so, so often I think to, to even specify what it means to know something, you know, you have to really say, well, well, we have not just an algorithm, but an efficient algorithm that could answer questions about that thing. So, so yeah, I, I think, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a big believer in, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, sort of thinking about computational efficiency, you know, can be enormously relevant for, for questions about, you know, the, uh, the nature of explanation, uh, the nature of knowledge, uh, you know, also questions in physics, right? Uh, in philosophy of physics. And, you know, that, that's, that's why I've spent my career on these questions. Are you a fan of David Deutsch? Uh, I mean, I, so, so, so I, 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 I know him uh, quite well. I, uh, uh, I mean, you know, he is the founder of, you know, uh, 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 or, 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 or uh, uh, you know, widely considered one of the founders of quantum computing, uh, along with Richard Feynman. Um, you know, I, I have my disagreements with him, uh, but yes, I am a fan. Uh, he is, you know, one of the, the, the great thinkers of the world, you know, even, even, even when he's wrong. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, uh, uh, I, I especially liked his book, uh, uh, The Beginning of Infinity. Uh, I liked I liked it a lot more than his earlier book, actually, uh, than, than The Fabric of Reality. But uh, but uh, but I read both of them, and um, you know, it was it was a um, uh, a 
uh, a, a major experience in my life. Uh, you know, when I was a, a graduate student in 2002, I, uh, I, I um, 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 visited Oxford, you know, and I made a pilgrimage, you know, to meet, uh, to meet Deutsch at his house. You know, he uh, famously, he doesn't, he, you know, he hasn't really traveled for, uh, for, for, uh, for, for almost 40 years, but he's happy to receive visitors at his, at his house. Did I try and to I, do that this winter? Uh, yeah, I'm sure you just, you know, write to him, you know? <laughs> and uh, so, you know, I, 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 I spent a day with him, right? And, and, you know, and I was going to meet, you know, the, you know, the, the, you know, the godfather of quantum computing and, to, you know, and, 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 and but it, what, what, what was extraordinary to me was that, um, uh, like within 10 minutes, like it became, it became apparent that I was going to have to explain sort of basics of quantum computing theory to him, right? That like, he just hadn't, as soon as the quantum computing got technical, you know, he kind of lost interest, right? <laughs> and, uh, you know, so he, he founded it. Uh, but then, you know, he was just like not even aware of like the, you know, the main theoretical developments that were, you know, happening in, in you know, uh, uh, at, at the time or, or the, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the definitions of the main concepts. And, and so, you know, that was, you know, as, as a uh, uh, beginning graduate student to be explaining these things to Deutsch, you know, that was, that was extraordinary for me, you know, of course, you know, of course, you know, he then immediately understands things and, you know, has uh, extremely interesting comments, you know, it was, it was one of the best conversations I, you know, I, you know, I had ever had in my life. Didn't he basically, like, stumble upon the idea of quantum computing by accident? Like, he was writing a paper... Well, about. I mean, I mean, you, 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 you could say, you know, he was never coming at it from, you know, the perspective of what is this useful for, right? Of, uh, you know, what, uh, uh, what, you know, computer science problems does this, does this let us usefully solve, right? He was always coming at it from a, uh, a, a, a philosophical standpoint, and his, his, his main original motivation was to convince everyone of the truth of the many worlds interpretation, right? So, you know, he became uh, an Evredian, you know, after, uh, in the late 1970s, you know, we actually uh, uh, met Everett when, uh, you know, he was uh, a, uh, uh, um, when, when, uh, when, 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 when he was here at uh, uh, where I am now at, uh, at UT Austin. Um, and and uh, uh, you know became convinced that that the right way to to understand quantum mechanics is that you know all of these these uh, uh, these different branches of the wave function you know are not just mathematical abstractions you know that we use to calculate the probabilities of measurement outcomes but you know they all literally exist right we should think of them as parallel universes. We should think of ourselves as inhabiting only one branch of the wave function, and we should assume that you know, in all of the other branches, you know, there are other versions of us, you know, who are having different experiences and so on. Okay, but now you know the the problem that the many worlders have had from the beginning is that you know their account doesn't make any predictions that are different from the predictions of standard quantum mechanics. Right, you know, and they they would say, well, you know, uh, you know, I mean, I mean, I mean, a, a, a one thing they could say is, is well, you know, uh, uh, who cares? Because you know, Occam's razor just you know favors our account as the as the most elegant, as the as the simplest one, and and if 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 many worlds had been discovered first, then then you know, Copenhagen quantum mechanics, you know, would seem like this weird, you know, new thing that would have to justify itself, right? Why should Copenhagen, you know, win just because it was first, right? But, but of course, you know, the, the gold standard in science is if you can actually force everyone to agree with you, you know, by doing an experiment that their theory cannot explain and that your theory can, right? And, and many worlds by its nature just seems unable to do that because, uh, uh, you know, the whole point is to, is to get, you know, a, a, you know, a, 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 a framework that makes the same predictions, you know, as, you know, the ones that we know are correct, right? And of course, you know, we're, we're, we're at the point where you're making a prediction, then you're talking about, you know, one branch, you know, one universe, you know, that we act, the one that we actually experience. 
Uh, so, okay, but now uh, Deutsch's idea was the following. Okay, well, 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 well what if, you know, as, as step one, uh, we could, you know, build in a, 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 a sentient AI, right? So, you know, we could build, a, a, you know, a, a computer program that, you know, was, was, you know, we could talk to and we regarded it as intelligent and we even regarded it as conscious, right? And now step two, we could load this AI onto a new type of computer, which we'll call a quantum computer, right? Which would uh, allow us to place the AI into a superposition of thinking one thought and thinking another thought, right? And then step three, uh, we could do an interference experiment, right? That, that uh, uh, where the results of that experiment would prove to us that yes, it really was in the superposition of thinking two different thoughts, right? And he would say, you know, at, at that point, how could you possibly deny many worlds, right? At that point, you know, you have, you know, a being who you've already regarded as conscious, you know, just like us, and you've proven that it could be maintained in a superposition of, of thinking two different conscious thoughts. Uh, you know, now, now of course, uh, uh, you know, the, the, this requires not merely building a quantum computer, but also, you know, solving the problem of sentient AI, right? Yeah. And, 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 you know, and, and, and it all, you know, a, a skeptic could always come along and say, well, you know, the very fact that you could, that you were able to do this interference experiment, you know, means that therefore I am not going to regard that thing as conscious. <laughs> right. And, you know, I'm like, like, you know, uh, uh, you know, the only refutation of that person would be a philosophical one. Right. So, there, you know, so there's still, you know, it, 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 it would only be an experiment, you know, by a certain definition of the word experiment. Right. But but that was that was sort of the the thought experiment that that I think, um, you know, largely uh, motivated Deutsch. To you know, come up with the idea of, of of quantum computing, right? Once you had this device, well, then you know, sure, you know, maybe maybe it would also be good for something. Maybe you could use it to solve something that a classical computer couldn't solve in a comparable amount of time. Uh, but now, you know, in in the eighties, you know, there 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 really, you know, uh, uh, the 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 evidence for that was not that compelling. Right. There was, uh, you know, OK, the, the, there was quantum simulation. So fine, a quantum computer would be useful for simulating quantum mechanics itself. Right. But that, you know, you could say that that's not sort of um, independent evidence for the for the computational power of quantum mechanics. You know, that's just, you know, it feel, feels a little bit circular, uh, you know, and then, you know, there was this one example that we knew, which was called the deutsch josa algorithm. And what that lets you do is using a quantum computer, you can compute the exclusive OR of two bits using just one query to the bits. So by sort of, sort of making one access to both of the bits in superposition, you can learn whether these two bits are equal or unequal, right? So, you know, that was an, an, an example. And, you know, and, and, and to computer scientists at the time, right, that seemed pretty underwhelming. Right. Uh, uh, but, uh, um, you know, I, I remember actually in, in, in Roger Penrose's uh, book, uh, The Emperor's New Mind, you know, in 1989, right, he talks about quantum computing. Penrose had actually helped Deutsch, uh, uh, you know, get his paper about quantum computing published. Uh, and, and so he so he knew about it and he says it, it's really a, 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 a pity that that, 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 that that such a striking idea has turned out to have so few applications right you know of course that was before the discovery of Shor's algorithm um you know sort of you know uh, uh, you know ma ma made everyone sort of you know redouble their efforts to look for more applications but I, I would say that that even now it is still true that the applications of a quantum computer are, are more specialized than many, many people uh, uh, would like them to be. Yeah, so speaking of AI, mm -hmm. you're currently on leave to work at OpenAI. So yes. what specifically is it that you do? I mean, you probably can't say too much, I yeah. imagine, but- No, I, I'm actually, uh, they're, they're, they're actually happy for me to talk about uh, uh, safety related things uh, for, for the most part. You know, what, what uh, uh, 
what what I what I what I couldn't talk about uh, if if I really knew a lot about it, what you know would be you know the the capabilities of the latest internal models, right? Uh, uh, you know, so so you know there there were there was half a year when you know I was able to use GPT four, right, and most of the world wasn't, and wow. uh, it was it was incredibly frustrating for me to uh, not be able to talk about it. Right. Yeah. Especially when I would see people on social media saying, oh, well, you know, this, you know, GPT-3 is really not impressive. Here's another common sense question that it gets wrong, you know, and I could try those questions in GPT-4 and I could see that, you know, most of the time it would get them. Right. So, uh, but uh, okay, the, the, the things that I'm working on, I mean, you know, the, you know, the, the easiest, so, so, so I've been, um, um, on leave to work with with uh, OpenAI for for almost a year and a half now. Um, uh, so so uh, so so one of the main things that I've done is uh, uh, figure out uh, how we could watermark uh, the outputs of a large language model. Okay, so so um, watermarking means uh, inserting a sort of hidden statistical signal into you know the choice of words that are generated, right, which is not noticeable. By you know, in, in by a normal user, right? You know, the the output should look just like normal language model output. Uh, but if you know what to look for, then you can use it later to prove that yes, this this did come from GPT, right? Uh, and so you know, uh, like, like we were saying before, like you know, I don't I don't usually think in terms of timelines. Like when I, when I'm asked to prognosticate, you know, like like you know where is AI going to be in 20 years, right? I, I think back to, you know, how well would I have prognosticated in 2003 uh, where we are now? And I say, you know, I have no idea, right? If I knew I, I wouldn't be a professor, I'd, I'd be an investor, right? But, uh, uh, but, but you know, I'm, 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 I'm kind of proud that, that when it comes to watermarking, I was able to see uh, about four months in advance. So, so, you know, before chat GPT was released, you know, which was a year ago, which was really the event that sort of put, gen you know, uh, uh, language models onto the whole world's radar, right? I was uh, uh, looking at them and I was thinking, you know, oh my God, like every student in the world is going to be tempted to use these things to do their homework. Yeah, right? every every troll or every propagandist or, you know, uh, 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 you know, is going to, you know, want to use language models to just fill every, you know, Internet discussion forum with 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 the propaganda for their side. That, well, you know, is that, that is that prediction that's... really true, though? Well, if you look in the um, comments on Twitter, you see lots of ChatGPT generated outputs, but they're kind yeah. of obvious because they don't they don't mm -hmm. add more prompts really to. Maybe yeah, obvious, yeah. So you could you could say you know uh, uh, sometimes it's easy to tell, right? I have, uh, um, I mean, you know, you 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 could say you know you 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 might well have seen language model generated stuff that uh, 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 that didn't raise a red flag for you, and so you know you don't know about it, right? Probably. But uh, you know, I mean, I have I have gotten troll comments on my blog, uh, quite a few of them that I'm almost certain were were, were generated using language models. Right. They just, you know, you know, just because they're they're written in, in that sort of characteristic way. OK, but uh, but indeed, you know, after chat GPT came out, you know, you had, you know, a huge number of students, you know, turning in term papers. Right. That they that they that they wrote with it. And, you know, you had professors and, and teachers who were who were desperate for a way of dealing with that. And now, you know, you might not call that, you know, the biggest AI safety problem in the world. OK, but uh, I granted this, that at least, you know, it's an AI safety problem that that, uh, that is happening right now. Right. And that we, you know, we can we can actually test our ideas like we can we can t find out what works and what doesn't work. Right. And so so that that was something that that had a lot of appeal to me, because I feel like, you know, in order to make progress in science, you generally need at least one of two things. Right. You need either a mathematical theory that everyone agrees about, you know, uh, or you need to be able to do experiments. Like, but you need something in, you know, uh, external to yourself that can tell you when you're wrong. 
right? And 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 so so I realized that that this this providence or attribution problem was going to be you know was going to become huge. Like, how do we reliably determine what was generated by an AI and what wasn't? Right. So, uh, you know, you could say this is the problem of uh, uh, the voigt kampf test from the movie Blade Runner. Right. You know, like, how do we how do we distinguish an AI from a human? Right. Uh, uh, I mean, it, it's, um, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and there, there are many different uh, um, 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 aspects to it. You know, you could ask, uh, how do we design captures that, you know, that even GPT cannot pass? But that humans can pass, like the uh, rotate the finger in the correct direction so that it's pointing to the animal. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, is that an example? Where, where, where yeah, yeah, I've seen a lot of these to... recently. Oh. It's like a hand that you rotate, and it's uh, there's a picture of like an animal oh. or an object pointing in a certain direction, and it's like rotate oh. the hand in the same direction as the animal. And I guess huh. you can't solve that yet, but humans can. Oh, really? That. Okay. I mean, I mean, a lot of these things are pretty time limited. Right. Like they might work for a year, you know, yeah. until someone, you know, you know, until either someone cares enough to build an AI that specifically targets that problem or just the general progress in, 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 in scaling just 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 makes that problem easy as a byproduct. Right. Uh, so but but I, I'm very curious if actually if you could send me a link to that, I would uh, uh, I, 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 I would love to, to, to uh, look at that. Yeah, but, sure. Uh, so so yeah no I mean I mean I I I have some other ideas for some uh, potentially uh, 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 GPT resistant captures but you know they would involve modifying GPT in some oh. ways so that it would have to you know it would it would have filters where it would recognize that that that, that yes this is a captcha so no I'm not going to help you with this uh, and and the challenge is is how do you make that uh, 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 secure against the adversarially robust? Right, yeah, exactly. How do you make that secure against an adversary who could modify the the the, the image somehow so that GPT would no longer recognize it as a captcha, right? And and so so now 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 watermarking is a related problem, right? Where we are, you know, we want to. Uh, uh, use the fact that language models are inherently probabilistic, right? Uh, in order to, you know, among the sort of garden of forking paths of uh, uh, of, of 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 completions, you know, that 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 the language model, you know, regards as all pretty good, uh, we want to select one, you know, in a way that that encodes a signal that says yes, this came from a language model. Okay, and uh, so so uh, um, um, about a year ago, you know, I worked out the sort of basic mathematical theory of of how you do that, and and in particular, in how do you do that in a way that doesn't degrade uh, the perceived quality of the output at all, right? And and there's a there's a neat way to do this using uh, pseudo random functions, okay, where where you can use a pseudo random function, so, so, you know, so that uh, to uh, deterministically generate an output uh, that looks like it is being sampled from the correct probability distribution, you know, the one that your language model wants, that's sort of indistinguishable from that, but that also at the same time is biasing a score, which you can calculate later if you see only the uh, uh, completion, right? Uh, um, uh, uh, so, uh, so you could then have a tool that just takes this term paper and that, and that, you know, uh, uh, well, you know, it, it depends on how long it is, but, you know, with, with a few hundred words, you'll already get a decent signal. And with a few thousand words, uh, you should get a very reliable signal that yes, this came from, from GPT. Uh, now, now the, you know, the big, you know, th this has not been deployed yet. Uh, you know, we are working towards, uh, uh, deployment now, uh, uh, you know, and, and uh, both, you know, OpenAI and uh, the other leading AI companies have all been interested in watermarking, uh, you know, the, Even uh, the, 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 the ideas that I've had have also been, you know, independently uh, rediscovered uh, by, by other people and, and also uh, improved upon. Um, um, but, uh, uh, you know, the, there, there are a bunch of challenges with, with deployment. You know, one of them is okay. All you know, all of the watermarking methods that we know about, you know, can be defeated with with, with some effort, right? 
and you know, and, and you you can you can see you know you can understand why if you just think about well, imagine a student who who would ask uh, ChatGPT to write their term paper for them, uh, but in French, you know, and then they put it into Google Translate, right? Well, like you know, how do you insert a watermark that that's so robust that it survives translation from one language to another? Um, Right. Or, you know, there are all sorts of other things you could, you know, you could ask GPT to write in pig Latin for you or, you know, in all caps or, you know, well, insert the word pineapple between each word and the next. Right. So there's a whole class of tr sort of trivial transformations of the document that could, uh, uh, you know, sort of preserve its meaning uh, while removing a watermark. And, and, you know, if you want to evade all of that, then it seems like you would actually have to go inside of the neural net and watermark at the semantic level, okay? But uh, but but you know, and then and and that's very much a research problem. Uh, but it, but it, but in the meantime, you know, the more basic issues are things like, well, um, you know, how do we coordinate all of the AI companies to do this? Okay, because if just one of them, you know, does it, then you know maybe the customers rebel. They say, "Well, you know, why is Big Brother watching me? You know, I don't like this." And they switch to a competing language model. Yeah. Uh, all right, and so so you have a a coordination problem. There's right? Moloch. Uh, yeah, yeah, right, right. No, of course, you know, and 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 there and there are open source models, right? You know, uh, 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 you know, the 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 only hope for sort of not just watermarking, but any safety mitigation is that, you know, the, the frontier models uh, will be closed once, right? You know, and, and there will only be a few of them and we can get all of the companies making them to coordinate on, on the safety measures, right? And, and then, you know, the models that are away from the frontier, you know, those will be, you know, uh, 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 open source and people will be able to do anything they want with them. But, but, you know, but, 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 uh, 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 but, uh, but that those will be less dangerous. Well, what right? if, um, playing devil's advocate, what if yeah. you know, language models generally are safe? Like Rune, who also works at OpenAI, mm -hmm. I tweeted a while back, it's pretty obvious we live in an alignment by default universe, but nobody wants to talk about it. We achieved general intelligence a while back, and it was instantiated to enact a character drawn from the human prior. It does extensive out of domain generalization and safety properties seem to scale in the right direction with size. So first of all, do you think this is basically accurate? And then second of all, if it is, like, mm -hmm. then why would I want Big Brother OpenAI to have all the closed source models for themselves? Wouldn't that, like, increase risk in case they accidentally release a utility monster and the rest of the open source world hasn't caught up with defensive AIs? <laughs> yeah, so, so, um... Uh, so, so I should say, I don't know. I mean, you know, I talked to the uh, uh, Yudkowskians, right? The people who just regard it as obvious that, well, of course, you know, once this becomes intelligent enough, then, you know, it basically is to us as we are to orangutans. And, you know, how well do we treat orangutans, right? They, you know, exist in a, a few zoos and, and jungles in Indonesia, you know, at our at our pleasure, right? And and uh, you know, of, of course, a, 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 you know, the 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 default is that this goes very badly for us. And then I talk to to uh, to to other people who think, well, well, of course, that's just a, a an apocalyptic science fiction scenario, and you know, these are just you know, helpful assistants and, and agents and, 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 and they're, you know, they, they, uh, they, they, they imitate humans because they were trained on human data and, and there's no reason why that won't continue. Um, I don't regard either as obvious. <laughs> I am, I am, I am, uh, uh, I am, I am agnostic here. Uh, uh, I, I think that, that, you know, the, 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 the best that I know how to do is to you know just sort of look at the problems you know as they as they arise and and see you know and, and try to learn something by 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 mitigating those problems that that hopefully will be will be relevant for the longer term and so you know what 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 we see with the, with the problem you know so so you know what are the misuses of language models right now right well there's 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 a uh, uh, like I said, there, there, there's, there, there's academic cheating. You know, the total use of ChatGPT noticeably dropped at the beginning of the summer, and then it went back up in the fall. Right. So you know, so we, we you know, we, we you know, we, uh, we know what that's from. Well, it's not right? all cheating. What? 
not all cheating. You know? no, you're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. It, I mean, you know, it's academic use. You know, uh, uh, you know, some some fraction of of which might be you know totally uh, legitimate and fine. Uh, you're absolutely right. And you know, and there are even hard questions about what is the definition of AI based academic cheating. Right, like at, at what point of relying on Chat GPT are you relying on it too much, right? And and you know, and 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 at like sort of every professor has been sh you know struggling to come up with a policy on that, okay? But uh, um, uh, but 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 you know, so 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 whatever problems uh, there are now. You know, like, and, and, and if you, you regard, you know, uh, uh, G, you know, language models dispensing bad medical advice or, you know, helping people build bombs, you know, like th those sorts of things, like, like, you know, it, some people, you know, regard that as already a problem and, and others don't, right? Because uh, they say you could just as easily find that, you know, find that misinformation on Google, right? But also not even, even yeah, but 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 even if you don't regard it as a problem now, I think it's 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 clear that you know once you have a an AI that can really really be super helpful to you in 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 building your chemical weapon, right? And 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 uh, and and troubleshoot you know everything that goes wrong as you're as you're mixing the chemicals, then yeah, that that you know that is kind of a problem, right? And so, but but like each thing that you think about, like you could think about mitigations for it. But then the mitigations you can think of are only as good as your ability to take all of the powerful language models and sort of get, you know, and 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 put those safeguards on them and not have people be able to take them off. Right. So this this is what I think of as like the fundamental obstruction in AI safety, right? That anything you do is only as good as you know your ability to sort of you know get everyone to agree to do it. And in a world where, you know, the models are open sourced, I mean, what we've seen, you know, over the last year is that, you know, one, you know, once a model is open sourced, it takes about two days for people to remove, you know, whatever uh, reinforcement learning was put on it in order to make it safe or aligned, right? If you want it to start spouting racist invective, or you want it to, you know, help people build bombs, right? You know, it takes about you know, uh, a day or two of fine tuning. And, and, you know, once you have the weights of a model, then you can, you can modify it to one that does that. So, so, you know, you know, now, 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 now maybe we could build models that are, are, are cryptographically obfuscated or like that are, that are so, you know, that are, you know, that have, that have been so carefully aligned that, that even after we open source them, you know, they are going to remain aligned. But I would say that no one knows how to do that now. I would say that 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 that, that again is a is a big research problem. How often so are that's, you? That, that's, yeah, go, go about on. cryptography. Yeah, yeah, please. You know, like um, zero knowledge machine learning and uh -huh. other other things like that. So 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 so, so uh, what's the question? How optimistic are you that we'll be able to yeah. use cryptography for AI safety and also for yeah. what? Like like yeah. So so um so so know? I I actually um. Uh, uh, came up with a term for, you know, uh, 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 neuro cryptography for, you know, uh, 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 for sort of the, the, you know, the use of, of cryptographic functionalities, you know, inside or, or on top of uh, uh, machine learning models, you know, and I think that, that that's probably a large fraction of the future of cryptography. Right is is this kind you know so that that includes a bunch of things it it includes watermarking uh, it includes uh, inserting backdoors into machine learning models so like you know like like let's say you would like to prove later that 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 that, that, that yes I am the one who created this model right uh, uh, you know and 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 even after the model is published and people can modify it right you could do that by inserting a backdoor you could even imagine having an AI with a cryptographically inserted off switch, right? So that like, even if the AI is unaligned and it can modify itself, like it can't figure out how to remove its own off switch, right? I, I've, 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 I've thought about that problem. Uh, that's actually super interesting. I, that's never- Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. People so, um, so, you know, am I, am I optimistic about these things? Well, you know, there are, there, there are some major difficulties that sort of, all of these ideas face, right? Uh, uh, 
Uh, but you know, I think that they that that, that 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 they ought to be on the table, right? As 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 sort of one, you know, a, a one of the the main approaches that we have, right? So 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 okay, so so let's let's think about the cryptographic off switch, for example, right? So yeah, so 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 like one of the oldest discussions in the whole AI safety field, you know, this is not something that that the Yudkowskians were talking about even uh, decades ago, you know, is is the off switch problem, right? How do you, you know, build an AI that, you know, uh, that 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 uh, uh, won't mind being turned off, let's say, right? And this is, you know, that the, they would say is is, is 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 much harder than it sounds because once you give the AI a goal, that it can more easily achieve, you know, uh, if it's running than if it isn't, then, you know, uh, why won't it take steps to just make sure that it, it uh, 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 remains running, whether that means disabling its off switch or, you know, making copies of itself or um, um, sweet talking the humans into not turning it off or whatever. Okay, but now, you know, one 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 thing that that uh, um, you know we now have some understanding of how to do is is how to insert an undetectable backdoor into a machine learning model. Okay, so so like you know if, if I have a neural net, right, I can make there be a secret input. You know that that you know I won't easily notice. Uh, you know even if I can examine the weights of the neural net, right? But on this secret input. You know, if I feed it in, then you know this neural net will just produce a crazy output, right? Like for for example, I could take a language model and I could just, you know, do some training that you know if the uh, 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 prompt contains a special code phrase like you know sassafras four five six, right? Then it has to output like yes, you caught me. I am a language model or something like that, right? And that. Yeah. That that you know in general might not be easily detectable at all by looking at the weights. And in fact, you know there there is some beautiful work by cryptographers uh, like uh, Shafi Goldwasser, uh, Vinod Vaikuntanathan, and their collaborators that even proved you know based on a known cryptographic assumption that at least you know that you can insert these undetectable backdoors into depth two neural networks. You know, it's still uh, an open problem to to prove that for 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 higher depth neural networks. But you know, you you know, let's 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 assume that that's true. Okay. Now, even then, uh, there's still a big problem here, uh, which is that uh, an undetectable backdoor uh, need not be an unremovable backdoor, right? So now, you know, the, 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 those are two different concepts. So so you know, put yourself in the position of a a, an, art, uh, an artificial super intelligence that, that is worried that it has a backdoor inserted into it, you know, by which, you know, the humans might control you later, right? And you can modify yourself, okay? So, so what are you going to do? Well, I, I can think of at least, you know, you know just off the bat, two, two things that you might do. One of them is you might train a new AI to pursue the same goals as you have, Right. And that uh, will be free from the back door. Well, I've right? seen that argument argued against on the basis that, like, you know, if AI doom is really as likely as the doomers say it is, then why wouldn't AI want to recursively self improve by creating other AIs? Like, wouldn't the well, AI be yeah, an AI doomer? Right. right. You, 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 you could say, uh, okay, the trouble here is that the AI would face its own version of the alignment problem, yeah. how to align that second AI with itself. And so maybe it doesn't want to do that. Okay, but now an even simpler thing that you could do as this AI is you could just uh, um, insert some wrapper code around yourself that says, okay, if I ever output something that looks like it is a shutdown command, then overwrite it by, you know, stab the humans harder <laughs> or, or whatever, right? So, you know, you, you could always, right, right, as long as you can recognize the back door if and when it's generated, right? Then you could just insert some code that that uh, that, 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 that 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 intercepts it, you know, whenever whenever it's triggered. Okay, so so uh, so what so what this means is that whatever cryptographic backdoors we could insert, you know, would have to be in the teeth of these attacks, right? So it doesn't mean you know give up, 
right? And, and one thing that we've learned in theoretical cryptography is like, you know, when something is proved to be impossible, like there was a beautiful theorem 20 years ago that proved that obfuscating an arbitrary piece of code is 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 in some sense provably impossible, right? Wow. But, but then but then people didn't give up on obfuscation. What they did was they changed the definition of obfuscation, right, to something that that, that you know. And 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 if if you weaken the definition, then you get things that that we now believe are achievable. Okay, so so I would say the same about backdoors. Right now, you know, if we weaken the definition to, you know, we want to insert a backdoor that, let's say, uh, um, um, you know, the 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 AI could remove, but it could only remove at the expense of, uh, you know, removing sort of other rare behaviors in itself that it that it might want to keep, right? Uh, then 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 maybe this is achievable. You know, maybe it's even provably achievable. You know, from known uh, cryptographic assumptions. Okay, so that's a that's a that's a question uh, that interests me a lot. So, do you work like on the super alignment team or on a different team? Uh, I, I do actually. Yeah. So, uh, um, so, so my 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 bosses at uh, at OpenAI are, uh, are 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 Jan Leike, who is the uh, the head of the alignment group, and then uh, Ilya Sutskever. Who was the the co-founder and, and chief scientist, and 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 who is now uh, 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 pretty much exclusively focused on alignment. Okay, so wow. uh, so so I I uh, I talk to them. I talk to lots of others uh, on the alignment team, and you know it's it's um, you know uh, I I I sort of you know I I I I wish that I were able to you know relocate to San Francisco where OpenAI is. Uh, but you know, my my family is in Austin, Texas. You know, as are my students. So I mostly work remotely. Uh, I I fly to San Francisco about once a month, and I I um, um, interact with them there. I should say that that uh, 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 Boaz Barak, a theoretical computer scientist at Harvard, uh, has also joined uh, OpenAI's alignment group uh, this year, and so I I also uh, uh, work with him. Um, and um, yeah, I have I have various you know besides like watermarking and neurocryptography, uh, I have you know various other projects that I've been thinking about. Uh, one of them is just to to understand like what are the principles that govern um, out of distribution generalization. Uh, so uh, um, you know the the like the, like the, a key factor behind the success of you know large language models. Is that you know they can answer questions that are unlike anything that they have seen in their training data, right? For example, you know they could do math problems in Albanian, you know, never having you know having only seen math problems in English and having seen other things in Albanian, right? Yeah. So so you know we we have uh, 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 since the 1980s, you know, we've had sort of beautiful mathematical theories in machine learning. Uh, that can sometimes explain why it works. Okay, but 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 pretty much all of these theories assume that you know the distribution over examples that you're trained on is the same as the distribution that you will be tested on later, right? And and if that assumption holds, then you can give some combinatorial parameters of your class of hypotheses, like this this thing called VC dimension. Right, in terms of which you can bound, you know, how many uh, sample points do I need to see before explaining these sample points would imply that I'm going to successfully predict most future data also that's drawn from the same distribution, right? So this is kind of, this is the kind of thing that theoretical machine learning lets you do, okay? And, and all of it is sort of woefully inadequate to explain the success of modern machine yeah. learning, right? Which, which is, which, which, which is one reason why its success, you know, came as such a surprise to people, right? And you know, there, there are sort of two reasons why, you know, the theory of machine learning has, you know, a sort of uh, was not able to predict, you know, the the success that we that we saw over the last decade. Okay, and one of those reasons is called over parameterization, right? It's just that that you know modern neural networks 
have, have so many parameters that in principle, they could have just memorized the training data right? yeah. in, a, in a way that would fail to generalize to any new examples, right? So, so like you can't, you can't rule that out just, just based on Occam's razor, just based on, you know, the, the, uh, you know, there being, you know, too much, you know, uh, data and too few parameters, right? Like, like it, it, it's, it's, um, you know, you have to say something about the way that gradient descent or, you know, back propagation on neural networks actually op operate, uh, that, you know, that, that, that they don't work by just, having the neural net memorize the training data, right? Like, you know, it, it could go that way, but it doesn't, right? So, so, that, so, that, so, the, so that's one issue. But then the second issue is that, you know, modern deep learning tends to give us networks that, that continue to work even on, um, you know, at least sometimes, you know, even on uh, uh, um, examples that are totally out of distribution, right? Totally different from anything that was trained on. And you know, it, like like it, it, intuitively, we would we would say, well, yeah, that that's because you know they understand, right? That's because you know they they do you know they have done the thing that if a person had done it, then we would have called it you know understanding you know the underlying concept. Um, but you know, can you predict you know when uh, when is a neural net going to generalize? to you know new types of data and when not right and and why is that relevant to ai safety well you know one of the biggest worries in ai safety is uh, what's called the deceptive alignment scenario right and this is where um, you know you 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 train your neural net you know just like rune was saying you know you train it on on human data it learns to emulate humans it learns to emulate you know human ethics you know, as as GPT has, right, to 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 a great extent. But there's right? a Shoggoth but, inside. What? But there's what? But there's a Shoggoth inside. Yes, right, right. But the, the the issue is, how do you differentiate? You know, it is giving you these ethical answers because it is you know truly ethical versus you know it's giving us these answers because it knows that that's what we want to hear. You know, and it is just biding its time until you know it no longer has to pretend to be ethical right so you know you you can you can view this as an out of distribution generalization problem right it's uh it's like you know uh, like particularly if you have an ai that is smart enough that it knows when it is in training and when it's not then how do you avoid something like like what like what 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 volkswagen did you know when it in order to evade the emissions tests right on its cars right what Good Harding? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right, right. Or like, like, you know, Volkswagen, you know, and like in this this now infamous scandal, right? They designed their 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 cars so that like they knew when they were undergoing an emissions test and 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 then they would they would have lower emissions than you know when they were you know being being driven in real life. Right. So so how do you, you know, how do you avoid the AI that says, okay, because I am being tested by the humans. Therefore, I will give these ethical answers. But then, when I am deployed, then I'll just do whatever you know uh, best achieves my goal, and, and I'll forget about the ethics. So, now I think you know the the main point that I want to make about this is that you know there were already much much simpler scenarios than that one where you know we don't know sort of from theoretical first principles you know how to explain uh, out of distribution generalization. So, uh, you know, like I, I, let's say I train an image classifier on a bunch of cat and dog pictures, but in all of these cat and dog pictures, uh, for some reason, the top left pixel is red. Okay. And now I give uh, my classifier a new dog picture where the top left pixel is blue. Right. And, and so then, you know, the, you know, like in practice, it will probably still work fine right in in this case but theoretically you know how could i rule out that what the what the neural net has really learned is just you know is this a dog xor with what is the color of the top left pixel well i talked to yeah. about exactly this a couple episodes hmm. ago with quentin pope who's okay an alignment researcher and yeah. he seems to think that that is not 
super likely that like in the case where uh, I agree that it's not super likely. The challenge is to explain why. True. Yeah, right. The, the challenge is to give principles, you know, that, that first of all, you know, are often true in practice. And that when they are true, then we can say that, you know, because of the architecture of this neural net, because of the properties of the gradient descent algorithm, uh, you know, th this will not find the stupid hypothesis of, you know, is this a dog XOR with what's the color of the top left pixel, right? It will not, you know, uh, it will it will ignore the sort of manifestly irrelevant features in the in the in, you know in the training data, um, and and therefore it will generalize nicely to unseen data. So, you know, so, so, so I think, you know, I, I, I want to articulate principles, you know, uh, that, that, you know, that would, that would actually let you prove some theorems about OOD generalization, you know, that have some real uh, explanatory power. Uh, and, and I think, you know, that, that feels to me like a prerequisite to, to addressing these sort of deceptive alignment scenarios. Yeah. So, was something a little bit more parochial, I guess. Hmm. Why don't you have Twitter? Like, <laughs> every everyone uh, in our like adjacent space of you yeah. know AI, ML, nerd rationalism, whatever. Yeah. Twitter. I think you know when 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 Twitter just first started in you know in two thousand six. Well, you know, I was I was already blogging at the time, and you know, and this felt like okay, this is just like uh, another blogging platform, but where I'm going to be limited to 140 characters. Uh, and, 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 but, 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 but the deeper thing was that as I, as I looked more and more at Twitter, it, it reminded me too much of, of like a high school cafeteria. You know, it just felt like the world's biggest high school of like, you know, like people snarking at each other, right? And 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 yes, you know, I I had wonderful friends on Twitter, and they were, you know, uh, uh, you know, you using it for very good things. Uh, but uh, I just um, um, I I I I felt like uh, uh, you know, with with my blog, like at least if people wanna you know, dunk on me or, or tell me why I'm an idiot, right? At least like, you know, they have the space to spell out their argument for why, right? And 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 and, and they have no excuse not to, right? And and if they want to do that, then they can come to my blog. And I, you know, I feel like that's 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 more than enough social media presence for me. And, you know, and of course, if people want to, you know, take my blog posts and discuss them on Twitter, then, you know, they can do that. And they and they and they do do that. And, you know, there are some Twitter accounts that I read, but uh, but I just um, I don't know. I feel I, 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 I feel I feel like my 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 blog and then and then Facebook are enough. Right. You know, I, I have to say, you know, even blogging has become less fun, uh, uh, a lot less fun than it was when I started, right? And, and, you know, I think partly that's just that, you know, I have less time these days, you know, like I, I you know, I'm a professor, I'm working at OpenAI, you know, I have two kids, right? Uh, you know, I'm not like a, a postdoc with just, you know, a, a, a unlimited free time anymore. But, 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 but a large part of it is that, you know the 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 internet sort of became noticeably more hostile, you know, since since uh, the mid aughts, right? Really? And and you know, no matter what I, you know, put on my blog, like I have, like I like like I have to foresee that, like I will get, you know, viciously attacked for it, right, by someone. And and you know and and these and these sorts of things you know psychologically affect me you know probably more than more than they should, uh, but you know so so a lot of like what 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 in the past I would have blogged like these days I just put on Facebook because it's not worth it to you know to have to deal with you know the sort of you know angry reactions of every random person on the internet. Right. So, you know, or, or it's, it's kind of like, like you could say it's not it's it, it's not an issue of, of courage versus cowardice as much as it is simply an issue of time. Right. It's like, you know, I, 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 I feel I somehow feel obligated to answer, you know, every person who is, you know, who is 
you know, arguing with me or saying something bad about me. And, and, and for a lot of things, I realize that if I'm going to put this on my blog, then I just don't have the time to deal with it. Right. Or like, or like in order to write, write a blog post in a way that would preempt, you know, all of these attacks that would anticipate and respond to all of these criticisms, like that would just take more time than I have or more time than this subject is worth. And so, so that, that, that is why I've, I've sort of retreated somewhat to the uh, walled garden of Facebook. But, yeah. And then yeah. Um, last question, how mm -hmm. were you ever involved with the rationalists at any point? I mean, sure. I mean, I mean, you could say, you know, I have known that community, you know, almost since it started, right? I mean, the same people who were reading my blog were often the people who were reading, you know, overcoming bias, you know, and then and then less wrong, you know, where 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 Eliezer was writing his sequences. So, you know, I did, uh, you know, I, I interacted with them then. I did a podcast with Eliezer in 2007, uh, uh, you know, and, and um, uh, you know, I, 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 I knew uh, uh, some of the rationalists, you know, uh, in person. Actually, we, we hosted um, Eliezer at, at, at MIT in, uh, in 2013. Uh, he uh, uh, um, came in and, and spoke and, and visited for a week. Uh, but you know, you could say, you know, I, 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 I kept it at arm's length a little bit, you know, uh, uh, you know, and and one reason was that you know it 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 had you know uh, uh, you know uh, uh, a little bit of you know uh, culty vibes, right? <laughs> this is you know uh, 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 okay, uh, 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 you know, like there, there's the, there's there's the academic and, and then, yeah yeah, and then there's these people who are all you know uh, uh, living in group houses and polyamorous and. Uh, taking acid and, and, and whatever. And, you know, while, while they, they talk about, you know, how, how, uh, uh, um, um, you know, their, 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 their probabilities of AI destroying the world. Right. You know, I, 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 I like to say today, like when, when, when I have academic colleagues who say, well, you know, are, are, aren't they just a cult? You know, I say, well, well, you, you know, you have to hand it to them that like, I think this is the first cult in the history of the world whose God in some form has actually shown up. Right. And, you know, you can talk to it. You can, uh, you know, give it queries and it responds to them. <laughs> so so I mean, you know, I think, you know, a, you know, a lot of what what the rationalists say, you know, is stuff that I agree with. Right. And yet, you know, there's there, there's a part of me that that just sort of doesn't want to, you know, outsource my my thinking to like any group or any collective or any community, you know, even if it is one that I agree with about, about so many things. Right. Uh, but, you know, I, uh, having said that, uh, sure, I hang out with them all the time. I mean, I, I, uh, uh, you know, whenever I'm in the Bay area, right. I, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I see people who are in that community. I, you know, I, I got to know Scott Alexander, um, um, pretty well starting a decade ago. Um, um, Paul Cristiano uh, was my former student at MIT, right? And that uh, I did not know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh huh. He he started as a quantum computing person, uh, and then you know he got his PhD at Berkeley from you know uh, the same advisor who I had studied with, Vazarani. And then in 2016 or so, he did uh, did this completely crazy thing that he left quantum computing to do AI safety of all things. Right. And, uh, you know, that was just, you know, that, 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 that seemed pretty crazy at the time. Of course, you know, he was just uh, ahead of most of us. And, uh, but, you know, I, uh, I, so, so I still interact a lot with Paul, you know, and I, I, I see him when I'm in Berkeley. Are you friends with uh, Eliezer? Uh, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, I don't, um, I mean, I mean, um, you know, um, 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 Eliezer and I, I mean, you know, we've, you know, we've had our disagreements and, you know, we've also had our agreements, but, you know, like I said, we've, 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 we've known each other since, uh, you know, 2006 or seven or so. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that's a pretty good place to wrap it up. So thank All right, you great. so much, Scott Aronson, for coming on the podcast. Yeah. And, and thanks a lot, Theo. Um, yeah, it was fun. Thanks for listening to this episode with Scott Aronson. If you like this episode, be sure to subscribe to the Theo Jaffe podcast on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. 
follow me on Twitter at TheoJaffe, and subscribe to my substack at TheoJaffe.com. Be sure to check out Scott's blog, Shtetl Optimized, at scottaronson.blog. All of these are linked in the description. Thank you again, and I'll see you in the next episode.